Right. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, my talk today, as uh, as just outlined, is basically legal principles that um, uh, that relate to restraint. Um, it's quite dry because the law is quite dry. But I, I'm, and you know, when I was reviewing my presentation this morning, uh, I realised that it, it has the possibility of going over half an hour. So I'm going to skim through really my presentation because my experience has been that the audience has a lot of questions for me. Um, so um, I, that, that's what I'm going to really emphasise on. But I just want to begin by saying this, that I was thinking this morning about legal principles that define restraint and what part the law plays in restraint and seclusion and deprivation and so forth. And I came up with three, three, three reasons or three points. First, it defines what's permissible, so what, how, you know, how uh, individuals should operate. Uh, in a lawful way. Secondly, and this is where I fit in really, it, it provides a safeguard for individuals who are at the back end of unlawful practices and want to seek redress. So that, those are the kind of clients that I see and sadly I see the extreme cases. And also, um, uh, and this is again something I'm involved in, it's a positive movement for change. I say that against the backdrop of um, perhaps not and I'm not criticizing the central government for this, but in, in times when there hasn't been much positive movement to develop good guidance, the courts and certain judges have taken it upon themselves in, in, in type cases where individuals uh, are bringing claims to set out what needs to happen or to highlight that we already have guidance and, in fact, these are the things that should be used. And, again, that's something that I'm involved in. But um, my, my life uh, uh, as a barrister really kind of deals with um, clients who, who are in three sectors. People who are detained under the Mental Health Act, um, under be it Section 2 or Section 3, and restraint policies there are obviously authorised by the responsible clinician and a multidisciplinary approach. And I, I'm going to talk about a lot of about what should happen in a utopian society. And that's, 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 I, I do that a lot because that's, I think it's very important. I mean, we may, we may not achieve it, but at least um, that, that's what we should be working, work, working towards. But um, that's one sector. The other sector are individuals who lack capacity. Uh, and this is where the United Kingdom is, is, is in really at the, the forefront of developing this kind of law about individuals, protecting vulnerable individuals who lack capacity. Uh, and when restraint and seclusion, for instance, in an isol isolation room or otherwise, is lawful. My, my experience is that if you're restraining somebody, the, nine out of ten times they lack capacity by reason of a diagnosis of learning disability or autism or, 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 or whatever it is. And then there's this third, uh, there's this third uh, class of individuals who are, um, who are above the age of 16, because if you're below the age of 16 and you're subject to restraint, then technically and legally you should be getting that authorised from the, from the family court. Some of you may be in shock and horror there. <laughs> this is my past experience. But, um, but, uh, but th there is that class of individuals who are above the age of 16 who have capacity but who may be subject to restraint. And they are in this kind of lacuna pla place where they don't have the, the, the safeguards that perhaps the Mental Capacity Act provides or the Mental Health Act provides. Um, and for them, really, they can just really rely on the, the Human Rights Act. So having given that really large um, preface to my presentation, I'm going to move on, as I said, because uh, I want to um, have time at the end for lots of questions. But I, when considering the legal aspects, we have to come back to this in restraint, which is Article 5 of the European Convention of Human Rights. We've been talking about it for years, uh, and the Daily Mail have, has a very clear stance of, 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 of its view of, of the Human Rights Act. But it's a great piece of legislation, one of the best um, pieces of legislation uh, that, that I've ever seen because um, Article 5 sets out very clearly that everyone has a right of liberty and security and no one shall be deprived of their liberty save for following scenarios. And if you are deprived of your liberty, then there must be a mechanism in which that is determined to be lawful and reviewed on a regular basis. Now, you may be saying, what's deprivation of liberty got to do with restraint? Well, I'll come into that because there's been recent case law which now makes it absolutely clear that restraint amounts to a deprivation of liberty. And as a result of that, there follows you know, safeguards that one has to go through. So we had um, uh, the, the convention in 53, um, and um, we had to wait a long time, over 50 years pretty much, for, for real 
law to change in our country. And we, we came up with a decade of change, as I call it, with the Human Rights Act um, in 1998, which really all it did in simple terms was to make sure that the convention was within our law, even though we were signatory to the convention. And then we had the Mental Capacity Act, uh, the Code of Practice and so forth. And we had this Bournewood case, which is quite a leading case in the, the European courts, which then led to what we now have, which is the deprivation of liberty safeguards. So it's a way of authorizing um, restrictive practices if someone lacks capacity without the need of going to court. Sorry for those who have taken photographs. Um, I'm sure if, if you email me, I'll, I'll send you a copy of my presentation if it needs to be. Um, but the most significant development, as I said, is for individuals who lack capacity under the Mental Capacity Act. Now, that's for the first time provides a legal uh, framework um, of decision-making uh, for those who lack capacity. And the basics of that, and I, I, I'm sure you're all aware, but the basics are that before the act is activated, before the safeguards are activated, you have to lack capacity. And the lack of capacity is decision-specific as opposed to before the act. So you, you can have... Uh, capacity to make a decision about um, your finances, but you may lack it in relation to making a decision about your residence or care. And there's a presumption of capacity, so it's protected. Our personal autonomies are protected in terms of capacity unless someone can establish that, 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 that you lack it. And, um, uh, and that, you know, the, the other thing about capacity is that we've got to take all steps to ensure that we're giving per the person all the right um, assistance so they can reach their own decision. There are two fundamentals to the uh, Mental Capacity Act. The first is that everything that's done is for uh, and must be in someone's best interest. What does that mean? Well, there's been a decade of kind of <coughs> case law which defines what best interests mean. Because this, uh, again, when we're talking about people who lack capacity, it's amazing how much scrutiny the court has on deciding what's in someone's best interest um, uh, and, and the principles they apply. But uh, you can just use the, 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 the normal term. But, but the most important one, which is most pertinent for today, is that anything that's done for an individual who lacks capacity must be done in the least restrictive way. And so that has a real bearing for res restrictive practices. This um, has to contrast with what we have under the Mental Health Act, which primarily, as I say there, deals with patients who are detained for assessments or for treatment. And that if they're sectioned, as I put it in, um, in quote terms, they have a, a review mechanism by way of the responsible commission, uh, uh, clinician, rather, an appeal system and the mental health tribunal where they can challenge their, their own detentions. But um, what I called here was a historical lacuna, which was before the Mental Capacity Act came into play in 2005. What happened to those individuals who lack capacity who weren't within the definition of the Mental Health Act. So they, they didn't need detention under, for assessment and they didn't need detention for, for, for treatment either. Um, what happened for those individuals? Well, that's the lacuna that came up in the uh, Bournewood case. And as I said before, this was a case at the European Court of Human Rights. And there was a, um, yeah, it was a chap who had a diagnosis of autism living in the community. He was um, readmitted to the Bournewood Hospital and he wasn't sectioned because he didn't resist admission. He was quite happy to be there. But there was a dispute that arose between his carers and his family about his care and treatment. Uh, 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 and, um, and there was a different view taken by the clinicians. Now, the, the court said very clearly, in no uncertain terms, that he was, number one, deprived of his liberty because he wasn't allowed to leave. Uh, and uh, and in more important to that, there was no procedure in place or opportunity for his conditions of detention to be reviewed. And so if we look at the parallel um, kind of line, if he was, if he was section under uh, section three or section two, there was a process in which he could challenge the conditions of his detention. But because he wasn't under the Mental Health Act and was happy to be there, there was no opportunity for him to challenge anything. So the court said that this wasn't compliant with Article 5.4, which was then the first time now, lots of heads was, was, were, were being scratched in central government because they, they realised that actually the, one of the things we have, uh, uh, there is a sector of people who are being unlawfully detained. Um, and th that's exactly what I've just said there. I've, I've preempted what I was going to say in my next slide, um, that, the, that um, you know, there was no formal procedures for the reasons for admission, continuing assessment, uh, and so forth. The result was the Mental Health Act, 2007, 
which provided the deprivation of liberty safeguards. This was the new scheme at the time, and it was a procedure for authorizing the deprivation of liberty and restraints, uh, and provided the safeguards and protections um, for the most vulnerable, as I say, in society. The code of practice. Government guidance is nine out of 10 times quite good, um, but perhaps not all the time considered. Um, and that's where the courts get really quite <coughs> peeved, if I can put it that way, because there, there is nine or 10 times a plethora of government guidance which deals with the situation. And it sometimes takes the courts to, in their judgment, to go through in succinct terms what the guidance is. But the code of practice for the Men Mental Capacity Act says quite clearly that the deprivation of someone's liberty is a very serious matter and should not happen uh, unless absolutely necessary. So there's a positive obligation, um, and I'll um, keep this really simple, there's a, there is a positive obligation on, on the state, so on a local authority, to when they find out that a deprivation of liberty is occurring, to end it. And if they can't end it, then to make it the most restrictive possible. So what we're talking about today is fundamentally enshrined in human rights law, that we, we have to, if we have to have restraint, it must be the least restrictive uh, possible. Um, when do the dolls procedures um, uh, apply? I call them dolls, the deprivation of liberty safeguards. Um, they apply when an individual who lacks capacity is in hospital, for instance, or in a care home. There are loads of people now who are in a community setting in supported living premises who are not subject to a deprivation of liberty safeguard. But if they are being deprived of their liberty, then you can get an order from the Court of Protection to authorize that. So there is another way in which to protect individuals. And there are their requirements, and I, I, I shan't go through them in, in detail, but you have to be over the age of 18, you obviously have to lack capacity, got to be in their best interest and the least restrictive are probably the most important and salient um, points. Um, there was a big case last year called Cheshire West and Cheshire Council in the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in, in England and Wales before we get to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. And um, it, it really defined what the deprivation of liberty was. Before that, there were three criteria. Uh, I'm putting it as simply as I can. Um, you had to be objectively deprived of your liberty. So on an objective analysis, not subjective, you had to be deprived of your liberty. Um, uh, the individual can't consent to the deprivation of liberty was the other thing. And it had to be imputable by the state. Um, there's a huge argument. I'm involved in the case at the moment with, where there's a definition of what is the definition of imputability to the state. Cut through it, the, the bottom line is that the state is actually depriving the person by way of, for instance, a package of care or, or a restraint policy. Um, the Cheshire West case didn't deal with the, um, the second and third point. It dealt with the objective analysis. So, you know, when is, when is someone deprived of their liberty? Well, in Cheshire West, um, P, because P means protected party, and every single client in the Court of Protection is called P, um, so we have lots of P's. Um, um, P ha had a diagnosis of, a, well, he had cerebral palsy and diagnosis um, of uh, Down syndrome, required 24-hour care to meet his personal needs, and he was placed by the local authority, which was Cheshire West, in a community placement in a bungalow where he shared with two other residents. The Court of Protection, so the first court they went to, uh, uh, where the local authority took the case to authorize the deprivation of liberty, said that, yeah, it's a deprivation of liberty. The Court of Appeal, which is the next court up, um, and a particular judge said, well, actually, um, you know, um, uh, it, it's not a deprivation of liberty. And the official solicitor who represents people who lack capacity took it to the Supreme Court and said, well, listen, we need a, a proper definition. Well, we got it uh, in a very, very easy judgment as well. Um, if you put Cheshire West in Google, and you put Lady Hale, who's the judge, uh, you'll get this judgment. And it's uh, unlike most judges who take a long time to describe something quite simple over 40 pages. She's completely opposite. She actually defined it very, very easily. And she said this, that if you are under continuous supervision and control, which in my definition means as soon as you are restrained, you are under complete uh, supervision and control, and you're, you're not entitled to leave, so you can't get out of that restraint, I'm just putting this into context, then you are deprived of your liberty. Simple as that. Um, before, there was a, a bit of ambiguity as to whether you were or not, but now you are deprived of your liberty. And what wasn't relevant, the court said, were all these things. The person's uh, compliance or lack of objection. Uh, and the reason why the, court, the, the, the judge went through these, this list is because the previous court, who said that P wasn't deprived of liberty, said, well, 
he's not deprived of liberty because of, uh, of the phenomenon which I've called as good as it gets, which is that actually he doesn't really understand what's going on. He doesn't have the mental facility to understand what's going on. This is as good as it's going to get for him. And so for a person who, who lacks capacity and who has quite severe um, 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 diagnoses, you can deprive them of their liberty quite easily. Um, or, you know, um, uh, or put another way, that um, it doesn't really make much of a difference. Whereas somebody who doesn't have a diagnosis, you can, a lot of restraint will then, um, well, I th I'm thinking I'm getting this the wrong way around, but I think um, if you don't have a diagnosis, then you can be easily deprived of your liberty and therefore you have the safeguards, which didn't, you know, didn't make sense. And what the judge was saying in, in the Court of Appeal was that it's about the relative nor normality of the person. So you've got to consider the person, which straight away, is discriminatory because you have different standards. You're applying for someone who has perhaps a diagnosis and has a learning disability compared to someone who doesn't. So it didn't make sense. So the, the Supreme Court um, d decision was really, uh, um, we, we were all happy when we, when we got it, put it that way. Um, Baroness Hell, who is Lady Hell, she went on to say, and this is how she summed it up, because of the extreme vulnerabilities of people like P, again, another P, and Meg and Meg, who are another two individuals, I believe that we should err on the side of caution in decides what constitutes a deprivation of liberty. And it's just not about definition, because as soon as you're deprived of your liberty, you have the safeguards. That's, that, that's, you know, that, that's, that's the important part. So what are the consequences of that? Well, on the ground at the coalface, as we like to say in the North, uh, um, it's had a significant impact because uh, a large number of people are now legally deprived of their liberty, which they weren't historically before this definition came in um, and requires authorization, be it un under the standard authorization if you're in a care home or a hospital or if you're in a supported living, then you need to be authorized uh, by the court to do that. That's one consequence. The second consequence, and bring it all back to restraint reduction, is that it really puts into sharp contrast, as I say, the importance of ensuring the lawfulness of restricted practices. And I say that because I'm not sure if um, any of you have seen this document before, but if you Google it again, you'll, you, you, you'll, you'll get this report. But it's the UN report uh, on torture and other cruel, in, inhumane, and degrading treatment or punishment. And that's Article 3 of the Convention. But that said that both prolonged seclusion and restraint may constitute torture and ill treatment. Uh, and they addressed the issue of solitary confinement and stated that its imposition of any duration, that's the important part, uh, on persons with mental disabilities is cruel, inhumane, and degrading. So you're in breach of Article 3, which is one of the fundamental articles. Um, and it's, um, uh, they also went on to say, referring to this case in the European Court of Human Rights, this Czech Republic case, that as a matter of law, that restraint on people with mental disabilities for even a short period of time may constitute torture or ill treatment. So if you get it wrong, sorry, I'm the bearer of bad news here, it's, it's pretty hardcore, <laughs> to put it in simple terms. Um, well, um, bringing this all back to me, um, uh, my involvement in restraint reduction, if I can put it that way, has been over a decade now since um, my involvement in the Blue Room case, which I'm not sure if, uh, many of you have heard of, but it was a significant, ca a significant case uh, over the last, um, it's still ongoing, but it started in 2011. Uh, essentially, and I'll just skip, um, these were the facts. Um, CP, um, not called P, but he's called CP in this case, um, he had a diagnosis of severe autism, learning disability, exhibited extreme challenging behavior, including severe anxiety, sensory impairment, aggression, destructive traits, significant self-harm to others and carers. So, you know, pretty bad situation. He was placed in a specialist school, uh, which was a charity organization, um, which no longer exists, sadly. Uh, but um, he was placed there, and they started using for him a room which was colored blue um, as a means of ways of ensuring that his behavior was manageable um, because they just they, they couldn't manage his behavior uh, when he was presenting with ag aggressive and destructive traits. So they, they, they put him in this blue room because they thought he liked the color blue. And this room, which was used perhaps five to 10 minutes a day, became, by the time I got the case, where he was spending seven hours a day, um, and which was padded, uh, locked from the outside, and um, there he pretty much resided for the majority of the day because they couldn't, they couldn't, um, they couldn't manage his behavior. 
Yes. Well, at the time it did. Um, um, but let me, re let me re answer that. No. <laughs> let me answer that. Um, I, 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 do, I, I do this regularly in front of judges. <laughs> What I actually think about what I've just said, I kind of um, no, I, I don't think it does because um, they wouldn't allow him to leave. So I mean, it was I mean, on a practical level, the, the mere fact that he was locked, and they did physically lock the door, um, even if he was unlocked, they wouldn't let him leave until he, they thought his behaviour was of a standard. Don't know whatever that meant. Um, uh, to, to to so that he could be safely brought out of the room. Um, the worst part of it all is that. Um, one of his parts of his behavior was that he would regularly undress himself and they would place him in there for that reason and not let him out until he had dressed himself, which would never happen. And um, if it could get worse than that, there was only a, a very limited keyhole, or a, 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 not a keyhole, but it was a small window in the door, which essentially meant that, there were, there were, that he could sit in certain parts of the room without being visible. And you know, there's been a plethora of cases, especially in the States where people have been seriously injured um, uh, as a result of that. But anyway, so that's, that, that, that was his situation. And remarkably, knowing that, the uh, local authorities said that he wasn't deprived of his liberty. <laughs> 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 um, and we had, you know, two weeks in front of um, a high court judge, Mr. Justice Ryder, who's now a court of appeal judge, and we argued it out. And uh, no surprise, he said, yeah, he's deprived of his liberty and he's subjected to um, uh, inhumane and degrading treatment and breach of Article 5 because that process and that policy was not um, properly uh, um, thought about. And my, my um, just bringing this to, to my experience is that's, that's when I started and that's when I really got involved with Sharon Paley, which I think some of you are, who are aware of who, who worked for BUILD. Um, she's now, she now lives in Australia and um, she was brought in as one of the first experts in the case um, to look at the positive behavior plan, multidisciplinary approach, and in a way um, to ensure that the use of the blue room was reduced. And, um, and as a result of that, um, I started getting involved in lots more cases like this, uh, and Sharon and I thought it was a good idea to have a, a, a cross-jurisdictional comparison as to how things happen in America, how things happen in Australia, uh, and other parts of European member states. And so we, we, we kind of developed a book which we published through, through BUILD, which looks at the, com it's really a comparative study. And um, at the end of it, um, well, that's the end, but at the end of it, um, not very well prepared today, am I? Uh, at, the end, at the end of it, um, I come up with really, uh, and, and I hate kind of reading out of my own thing, but it, it's worth mentioning because it's all the same story. And it's, it's not, it's not brain, brain surgery, if I, if I can put it that way. It's, it's, it's quite simple if, you, if you're trying to reduce uh, restraint and, uh, in a lawful way. But when we were looking through all the different kind of in North America and we're looking at Canada and, and Australia, and Australia is fantastic, especially Victoria, because they really deal with individuals who, who, who perhaps um, have capacity but are subject to restraints in a better way than we do. We don't have a safeguard. They actually do have a safeguard. But when we were looking through all of it, we came up with four guiding principles that were really important in any kind of restraint um, policy. Uh, and the first thing, and we all talk about it, is leadership. Um, um, I never really understood what leadership w was as a lawyer but when in the context of this, but I, I now understand what that means, but I, I don't need to go through it in any detail because we, we, we heard the previous speaker talk about that. The second thing was actually meeting someone's needs. Now, we in the UK are quite lucky. We've now got the CARE Act, and we had previous community care uh, um, uh, laws which set out how what someone's needs should be identified and how they should be met. Um, but the importance of, of assessing someone's needs is just not that approach, but having a multidisciplinary approach. Because one of the failures in the Blue Room case was that no one actually got together to actually, you know, from SALT expertise, from OTs to consultant psychiatrists, you know, psychologists, no one got together to develop a positive behavior plan. And fundamentally, no one was looking, and this is the key thing, to identify how to minimize or to prevent the behavior occurring in the first place. Um, no one thought about that, which is quite, you know, quite, quite, quite remarkable in itself. The third thing that we thought was really important was primary legislation, and I think that's where uh, you as stakeholders are so important um, in contributing 
and developing policy and guidance and changing law. Um, and like I said, you know, the, the, the courts and the judges have done that uh, over the last couple of decades. We now have the CARE Act, which is a pretty good piece of legislation, but your views are really the most important views in terms of con contributing to, to change, really. Uh, and the final thing that um, we, we thought was really important was the service, um, uh, the service providers require assistance in the development of quality behaviour support plans. And that has to come, I think, from government guidance as well. It just can't be left you know, in, in, a, in a hole. It has to come from government guidance. And as I said, we, we, we do have pretty good government guidance, be it in the health sector or in the education sector. I, I'm, some of you are, are, are in the education sector. You'd be probably aware of the Department of uh, the Health and the Department of Education joint guidance on reducing restraint practices in education and schools dated 2002 and 2012. So there's two pieces of guidances. You know, many people don't, are not aware of it. Um, but that's, that, that, that's really important um, in, in my view. So those are the th kind of four guiding principles that we, we thought were most important when, when you're considering restraint reduction. That's all I really wanted to say. Um, I think I've reached half an hour, but um, I'll be around for the coffee session. So sadly, I can't stay for the rest of the day. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.